Welcome to our seminar about peacemaking and conflict resolution. My name is Heidi. I'm working with the member care resource team for Vibem Europe. And we will have three days. So today, day one is the focus is on personal peacemaking. Tomorrow on day two, we will look into how can we coach others to deal well with conflict. And on day three, we will look into mediation and dealing with challenging situations. That's a rough overview of the coming three days. I'm very grateful that we have Marsha LaRocque with us for the speaker of this seminar. Marsha is a long-term member who served for more than 20 years with Vibem Heidebeck. And she has such a rich experience in discipling people, in training and developing people. She worked with DTSs, with team building, with staff care and staff development. And a few years ago, Marsha moved back to Minnesota where she originally comes from. So if we would sit with her in her living room, we maybe would see a deer walking through her garden. <laughs> Marsha played a crucial role in bringing member care training to Europe, to Vivem Europe. And now she facilitates the member care training team for North America and Central America. She actually just came back from leading a pioneering member care school in Juarez, Mexico. For me, Marsha is a wonderful example of a lifelong learner. She's always reading some new book, exploring some issues that we just face um, through life and through being missionaries. She's for me a great inspiration as she is wrestling for to, to see God's perspectives in these different issues that we face as missionaries. I remember many, many very inspiring <laughs> discussions with Marsha. Marsha, thank you very, very much for making yourself available for us to teach this seminar. And thank you for continuing to invest into people so that we can grow. We very much appreciate your input. Let me pray and then I pass it on to you. Father, thank you so much that together with you, we never stop to learn and we never stop to grow. Father, thank you so much that you know the realities of our lives, all the beautiful things, all the good things, but also the challenging things and the conflicts in our lives or the conflicts in the people we care for. And Father, I pray that you give us wide open and perceptive heart and minds that we can grow in our understanding how you want us to deal well with conflicts. Mm -hmm. And Father, I pray as Marsha shares out of her rich experience and of her rich insights, Father, I pray that you lead her with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Marsha, over to you. Thank you, Heidi. Well, I find it a privilege to uh, to be able to share with with you, and especially to recognize that you know, we're coming from all over the world. As I sit here in my little house in Minnesota, with our finally our winter snow in the last few days, and uh, yeah, appreciate the, this opportunity. I was preparing my preaching for Sunday. I preached in the little church up in my town and we sang the Christmas hymn. I heard the bells on Christmas day. And I don't know, I was, I was hoping to play it, but my technology is not great. So I'm going to just share a few of the words with you, but it, it was, it really struck me how it relates to what we're talking about today. Um, it starts out and says, I heard the bells on Christmas day their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And here we are at, you know, in the Christmas season and that is, you know, we see that. We see that even in stores, we see signs that talk about the peace, peace on earth. We send Christmas cards that 
talk about peace on earth and goodwill towards men. But the third verse of that particular song says, and in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And it really struck me, you know, we are in the midst of a season when we recognize Jesus as the one who did and does bring peace. But we also recognize the lack of peace as we look around us and recognize yeah, that hate is strong. <clears throat> hate is strong and it mocks that song. And in the version of the song that, that um, I was going to play for you, the, the guy singing at first, he says, I just, I don't hear it. I don't hear it. And then as he recognizes God as the one who brings peace, and he says, ah, but it is a strong word from him. It is a strong word. They, the bells peal more long and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And I just, you know, as, as I was preparing for teaching, I just thought so much, that's our heart. That's our faith is that peace will prevail, that God will prevail and he will prevail here on earth. And one of the ways that we can be a part of that are, is to be peacemakers ourselves, is to learn more and more how to be at peace and make peace and to help others be at peace. And God shared that with us uh, right at the beginning. Uh, he told us that we are blessed as we're peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And in the message, uh, it says, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are in God's family. I love that. We can be those who help people know how to cooperate instead of compete and in another version blessed are god blesses those who work for peace and that really struck me because i think peace isn't something where we just say okay jesus came hallelujah peace on earth but we need we need to be those who work for peace and choose for peace and then in the amplified blessed spiritually calm with life joy in God's favor are the makers and maintainers of peace for they will express his character and be called the sons of God. I love the blessing part. We get that life joy, but also then again, that explanation that we need to be and should be makers and maintainers. It isn't just about, okay, let's quickly, let's make sure this conflict gets resolved. But we want to be those that are also literally making peace and maintaining it because that expresses the character of God. And so that's, that's kind of the heart behind this whole uh, seminar, actually, is to know that God is looking for us to be peacemakers, peace maintainers, people working for peace, people helping others to not fight, but instead to cooperate and learn to be reconciled. So I want to be a peacemaker. Um, and I believe that each and every one of you is here because that's your heart as well, that you want to be a peacemaker. And so normally in the classroom, I'd have you pray for one another in that, but I'm just going to have us declare that desire. Even where you're sitting, no one else will hear, but God will hear. And you know what? So will the enemy. So I just want to declare, I want to be a peacemaker and encourage you to declare that as well. And then declare also by God's grace, I will be a peacemaker. And I just pray that that will really be true for each and every one of us as we go forward, especially into this season, a season when we'll be meeting with our family and friends and we can be those who bring peace into every situation where we come. And again, we recognize peace is something that, you know, the whole world talks about wanting peace. And yet we don't do so well at getting it. 
I can I can go back to you know my days in college when we had the you know make peace and we had the marches for peace and up into this day when we're looking to have peace and be peace on earth because our heart has a desire made in the image of God we have a desire to be at peace with him to be at peace within ourselves and to be at peace with others and we see that in the scripture in second peter 3:14 so beloved, since you look, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent and make every effort to be found by him, spotless and blameless in peace, in peace, in peace with God, that sense of spiritual well-being, because we've lived a life of obedience. We want to be at peace with one another, uh, with ourselves, I'm sorry, with ourselves, that the Lord of peace would give us his peace in every time in every situation. We know the scripture that says that that peace will guard our hearts and our mind. It's not a peace the world gives, but God longs for us to have a peace within ourselves. And then peace with others, showing them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Be at peace with one another. That's one of those wonderful one another verses for us. So this is God's heart. And as we get together today, it's our heart as well. We want to know that peace with God within ourselves and with others. I just want to take a minute and just be a little bit practical here as we get ready to go on with the definition. I, we've sent out a number of handouts. And today um, we have the biblical peacemaking handout, which is an outline for today. And you can follow along with that as, as we go on. But then there's also a very important sheet, and that's the one called Personal Peacemaking, which is a worksheet that looks like this. And we will be working with that in our session today as we look at personal peacemaking. And then there's one other handout that we'll refer to in today's session, and that is the pamphlet on peacemaking from peacemakers. So just those are the ones that would be good to have handy today. The other ones we'll look at in the days ahead. So what, what, is, what is peace? You know, what is peace? What is this, this thing that we're looking for? When you think about peace, what do you think of? What is peace with God for you? What is peace with others and within? If we look at the dictionary, it, it will tell us peace is the freedom from disturbance. It's a tranquility. Or in the bigger picture, a state or period in which there's no war or a war has ended. Sometimes those wars aren't within nations, they might be wars within relationships. But peace is that place of freedom from disturbances in our, yeah, in our, in our life with God. But we're looking at something even beyond that as we look at the peace that God describes. So we're looking at a shalom. Uh, it's a well-being, it's a sense of wholeness. You know, as we think of, as we think of that song, peace on earth, goodwill to men, we're looking for that well-being and that wholeness. That's the thing that Christ brought when he came and lived among us, isn't it? Shalom is a welfare in our relationships with one another. It's the relationships that are positive within our community. And yes, the absence of war, but that shalom is something that produces security and a lack of fear. Sometimes right now in, in our world, it's hard to find that sense of security because we're being surrounded by so many fearful messages about global warming, about pandemics, about rumors of war, so many different things. So we really have to work to receive the peace that God has for us and to be able to walk in that sense of well-being that Jesus Christ has won as peace. So peace. It's what we're desiring. It's what we're after. And in that, there's a call that each of us have. And that is the call that God has given us in 2 Corinthians 5.18. He's called us to a ministry of reconciliation. And this is where I think, you know, as we look at this as member care workers, um, this should be, this is, this is really a, a, quite a key to our calling in many ways. It doesn't mean we're always going around and solving hot conflicts, but that we are part of a ministry of reconciliation, part of a ministry that longs for everyone 
to be reconciled with God, to be reconciled within themselves and to be reconciled with one another. It's, it's the work of the cross. It's, it is the gospel in so many ways. The cross reconciles us with God and gives us room to be reconciled with one another. I remember sharing in, in a DTS about that when God just kind of gave me the words, without the good relationships with one another, the cross is just a pole. <laughs> and so the cross really is that reconciliation with God and with each other that God, that Jesus provided when he came to earth. That is our ministry. It's a ministry all of us as his is called to. God's heart is always reconciliation. But we all know the reality, don't we? God's heart is reconciliation. His longing is for us to be at peace. But the reality is, and he says it himself in his word, there will be conflict. There will be conflict. And we're real people and there will be conflict. And what we want to do as we look at this today is we want to recognize that our goal is to manage the conflict, is to work through conflict with biblical principles so there are changed hearts and so God is glorified. That, that to me is the goal of even looking at these few days is how can we help manage conflict in our own lives but in the lives of others as well, to see our hearts changed and especially to see God glorified. So we're looking first today at personal peacemaking. And we want to look at it in a way that as we go through the process, you will see the, a way that you can help others go through the process as well. So we're doing it personally, but I want you to see a little bit as we do that, how can I someone else go through the same process? In a similar way. And so that's why I created this particular little worksheet for us to take a look at, because I think it's something that we can use in a similar format as we help others going through conflict as well. Personal peacemaking is something God calls us to. He says, as much as possible, as much as we can, be at peace with everyone. So we have a responsibility to do all that we can to be at peace with everyone. Are we at peace with our family, with everyone in our family? Are we at peace with that person that we work with? Are we at peace, even with someone we don't know so personally? Are we at peace with the person who sat next to us on the bus today? <laughs> you know, he wants us to be reconciled and at peace with all men. That's his heart. That's part of why Jesus came. And so personal peacemaking is a place to start. So we start there today. And we're going to start there by doing a little looking back. This is a rear view mirror if you, if you can't figure it out. Um, it looks like the rear view mirror on my car. And so I'm going to encourage us today to go through the process of looking back on a personal conflict, something that we have dealt with in our lives, could be reasonably current, maybe a little while back, but to just pick a conflict. And you might look at one that you're not sure when so well, or you might look at one you think did, but I'd like you to start by identifying and describing a past personal conflict. And we're going to do that on your worksheet. I left some spaces for you to fill it in. And we're gonna just take a couple minutes for you to pick a conflict and give a brief description. This isn't something that Someone else needs to be able to figure out what your, your conflict was. This is just for you personally as we go through the process. So just a brief description of a past personal conflict. And we'll give you two minutes to do that on your own. All right. So we have a, we have a personal conflict there. And I think you know, each of us recognize there is conflict in our lives. It is a reality, isn't it? I would love to be able to say no, there isn't. <laughs> so, so if you would all just very quickly unmute yourself, okay? And we're just gonna all make a, 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 voice, a voice vote here, okay? So if you don't like conflict, say no. And we're gonna hear everybody's, <laughs> okay? If you don't like conflict, say no. 
Ready? No. 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 All right. Okay. All right. Now, if you do like conflict, you get to say yes. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Kind of. Yes. Yes. Okay. We got a few yeses there. Okay. Here's another one. Like is a strong word. Yeah. Uh, all right <laughs> that's true isn't it okay so if there are no conflicts in your current situation you get to say no all right here we go if there are no conflicts in your current situation ready? no no um, ah, no oh a couple no's that's good all right and how many of you would say there are conflicts that you're aware of right now in your current situation you can yes. say yes yes yes, yes. 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 <laughs> right yeah and it's it, this is so often true thank you for that you can you can mute again but very few of us like conflict it is a strong word isn't it <laughs> uh, most of us find conflict to be something that we would just as soon not have around but the reality which we also found out is it's there and, and we can't, we're not going to eliminate it pretty much as long as we are here and not in heaven um, because of our humanness. And so most of us don't really care for conflict. Um, we will see a little bit later, some of you who said mm, maybe yes a little bit, uh, often respond to conflict in different ways than some of the rest of us. So we'll see that a little bit as we go on. We're going to be looking at conflict today primarily through um, some information from the Peacemakers uh, Ministry. I've given you the reference for that in your um, in your handout, and this particular um, item is from them. It's a more current uh, brochure than this one is. But about ten years ago, um, a number of people from YWAM, including Aki Lim and some leaders met with this organization and came to some agreement that we would try to use this um, process, this biblical process in our resolving of conflict within the mission. And um, so we went a little bit away from this um, structured uh, conflict resolution methodology and went to something more along these lines. And so we've been promoting that within member care and within YWAM Aki shares it as well and so that's a little bit where this is this, well, a little bit this is what this is based on today um, and it gives us a good biblical foundation for us to take a look at managing conflict also on cross-cultural teams um, this has been used in many places in YWAM in Asia in Africa and a number of other nations and so we recognize it is something because it's biblical we're able to use it across cultures it, isn't, it doesn't work as easily in every culture, but we can go back to the Bible and take a look at what God is saying. So that's what we're going to be looking at today as we look through personal peacemaking. And uh, this resource is also on one of your handouts. So what is conflict? What is conflict? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and, and give a, a definition of what conflict is? Disagreement? Disagreement. Okay, that's that's a good synonym, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just gonna say maybe not really seeing eye to eye, like not having the same view on something or belief okay. on something. All right, disagreeing on on something on a perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in the chat, it's going that's on when we are momentarily out of fellowship with others. Okay. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Accusation. Okay. Accusation can be definitely in the midst of conflict, can it? Okay. There is an other one, feeling of being irreconciled. Okay. Right. Unreconciled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to use a fairly simplistic definition. A difference in opinion which was mentioned, or purpose that frustrates someone's goals, interests, or desires. 
my my quickie definition of that is my desire runs into yours. <laughs> my desire or my thoughts run into your thoughts and um, we have conflict. Now we can broaden that and we will as we look at conflict, but I think it gives us that simple perspective of the fact there's a difference and that difference, especially in our desires, frustrates us and we are no longer at peace with you and often not even with ourselves. We can blow up into frustration with God as well. So this is the definition that we're gonna use. And with that definition in mind, and even with your experiences in mind, what causes conflict? And we're gonna take four minutes in a breakout room to just speak about what are the causes of conflict? What are causes you've experienced, what you recognize? What are the kind of things that when we're looking at being peacemakers and how can I help resolve conflict that we're realizing we want to be dealing with? What causes conflict? So did you find all kinds of causes for conflict in your groups? <laughs> uh, I think many of us recognize so many different things that cause conflict, the differences among us, misunderstandings, unmet expectations. I, I wrote one down on my list, people being people. <laughs> and isn't that some of it for us? You know, we're just human beings and so many times our desires and our differences really get in the way. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go forward and look at one of the things that the word shares with us and in terms of conflict. This is what is causing the quarrels and the fights among you? Don't they come from the desires that are at war within you? You want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. Hopefully we don't go that go that far but you can be jealous of what others have and you can't get it. So you fight and you want to get it uh, from them. You don't have because you don't ask. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You want only what would give you pleasure. I just you read those words from James and they are so strong and not all conflict comes from just this. But when we begin to look at conflict and that whole thing of desire meeting desire, um, or opinions being different. So many times if we look back and are able to look at our hearts, we can recognize some of these things. What is my desire? You know, is it my desire that I'm putting first here? Is it something that I wish I had that the other person has? Is there a jealousy in it? So James gives some strong words that have to do with our conflict. And as we look a little bit at some of the logs in our own lives, we recognize some of these things that relate to desires, desires that might not seem like a big thing, but become bigger as we interact with other people. What causes conflict? So of course, one of the things we would love to do as member care people is to work to eliminate some of the things that cause conflict, to create a peacemaking environment, even in the places where we live. How can we encourage an environment uh, where peacemaking is just a part of how we live together. And that would be a wonderful thing and a wonderful testimony to the world, wouldn't it? Yeah. In looking at our past conflict, what did you learn about yourself and about conflict? Now, I ask that question because I, I appreciated so much what Heidi said about, you know, being a, a lifelong learner because it is my heart so much. And I think it's God's heart for us as well, that we continue to be learners. But I wonder sometimes, you know, we all know we have conflict and we've had lots of conflicts along the way in our lives and we've gotten through them. But did we stop to learn anything from each of those conflicts? Or did we just, oh, yay, that conflict's over. I can go on with my life. Or do we learn even from our conflicts? Looking back at the conflict that you've, chosen. The second step we want to look at, we'll take three minutes to do that, is what did you learn about yourself and or about conflict from this particular conflict that you're looking back on? Okay. I guess uh, what I of course hope in, in terms of this seminar is that we will continue to learn and we will learn more about ourselves and how we deal with conflict. 
So that will help us learn about helping others deal with their conflict as well. I hope that you have, you know, even in looking back, maybe looking back, maybe now you can learn something from how you did it the first time. Uh, the question that we look at is, you know, is conflict good or bad? Um, how do you see conflict? You know, we talked about how many of us don't like it. Um, is that because we think it's a bad thing? Or is that because we just, you know, it just makes us not feel good? Is conflict good or bad? And we could do a quick survey on that. Um, I've done it many times over. And invariably, most folks say, yeah, it's, it's, not, so, it's not so good. Conflict is bad. But then you, again, that kind of like, yeah, good, good, bad. Many times people see conflict as being something that's bad, especially within the church and among Christians. We often think conflict is just something to avoid at all costs. Uh, in the book I was reading, uh, the fellow was a Mennonite, and he said, you know, there's a whole bunch of unwritten rules in the church, um, and one of them is avoid conflict at all costs. Thou shalt not have conflict. Um, conflict is a sin. And sometimes we come across that kind of feeling, and often in that, try to avoid conflict at any cost. I'm not asking you for a response to that, but just thinking and wondering, isn't that true in some of the situations you've been in, where there's that sense of avoid conflict at any cost? We sometimes, we often, you know, we talk about unity and the need for unity, and the fact it is, obviously, it is a testimony to the world, but is it really unity, or is it simply something where we've smoothed the surface that we would look good? Is conflict good, or is conflict bad? And I just want to, today, I hope that we can change a bit of our perspective on that. We can kind of turn it upside down and begin to recognize that conflict actually provides us with an opportunity. So often, if we're looking to avoid conflict at all costs, we get ourselves into peace faking. You know, we're faking that everything is okay. I think all of us, when I said, you know, do you have conflicts in your life? Almost all of us said yes. Uh, because most of us realize it is there. But are we willing to, you know, say that in other settings? Or are we more apt to say, yeah, no, things are fine. Things are fine. But if we can change our perspective, we're going to begin to see that conflict is going to give us opportunities to grow and to be those learners that we all desire to be. Conflict is an opportunity. That's, that's my premise, uh, the premise of the peacemakers. It's an opportunity to glorify God by how we respond. It's an opportunity to love and serve others by helping them recognize what's happening in their lives. And it's an opportunity for us to grow and become more and more like Jesus because it's going to help us see our own hearts as well. Conflict is an opportunity. It helps us discover ourselves. It's an opportunity to glorify God. <laughs> So take a look at that conflict that you had. Did you glorify God in your conflict? And are you happy with how you handled it? The next step in our worksheet to just take a look at that past conflict. So hopefully there's even a possibility that you could still glorify God in that past conflict if there's other things that you can do in following up on it. How can, how can we glorify God? And we recognize that Jesus prayed a prayer about our unity and our peace with one another in the fact that that's a way that we would witness to the world that he, he had come and that he'd been sent by the Father. So we really long to be those who are at peace with one another so that we can testify to the Prince of Peace here on earth. How do we respond to conflict? One of the things that is taught in the peacemaker, and I think is just gives us a good picture of what they call the slippery slope in our response to conflict. What is the way that I respond uh, typically? Maybe you will find you have a typical response, or maybe you have a different kind of response to different kinds of conflict. So there are a few ways that we can respond. We can try to escape. 
This is often the peace faking role. We can try to escape the conflict. We can deny there's a conflict, you know? Um, do we ever do that? Do we ever put it under the rug, you know, and just pretend, yeah, everything is fine. And we deny that that conflict is there. And then of course, the, the next day we run into that person and, and the conflict goes, you know, bubbling up again for us. And we recognize that denying is not gonna last very long. And so maybe we run. Maybe we escape, maybe we leave the situation or we leave the relationship. And as you see, it becomes that slippery slope. Um, it says die at the end, but it, it can mean the death of a relationship because we've chosen to deny something, but it's still there. We're not dealing with it. We find ourselves needing to get away to escape and relationship dies. Have you ever lost a relationship to not dealing with a conflict or a difference? Maybe we do it in smaller ways. Maybe we start with denying and then we finally have to get ourselves up to those peacemaking con uh, methods. But one of the key, one of the ways we often respond to conflict is to just escape the conflict. On the other side of that slope is the attack response or the peace breaking response. And that often, uh, often starts with gossip, with that attack on the other person that's behind their back, talking with other people, putting people down with our words. Maybe it's a verbal fight, our words coming at each other. You probably all of us have somewhere along the line been involved in a verbal fight or at least witnessed them. Obviously they can move into a physical fight Hopefully the, we don't see that very often, but we see it all the time as we look at the world around us that um, verbal fights become literal fights and physical fights and, and people and relationships get destroyed. Or as we see, of course, like I said, on television and we see in real life, the fights become that which kills the other person. We, talk, we think of Jesus who said, you know, if you hate your brother, it's just like murdering them. And so we see this possibility in the attack mode of fighting to win, of needing to win this situation, of needing to defeat the other person, those attack responses. Maybe we start simply with gossip. Hopefully we stop and we get ourselves back on a peacemaking track. But what are our tendencies? Do you have a tendency? What we want to do, of course, is find those peace-making responses. So we aren't a peace faker, we aren't a peace breaker, but we are a peace maker. Someone who is looking to make peace with all men. And in that we see the word overlook. Go, that means we're gonna to talk to our brother or our sister and or get help. These are some of the things that are part of the peacemaking responses that God provides as a safe place for us in response to conflict. Where do you come in all of this? Do you recognize your major or typical response to conflict? It's good for us to see what is my tendency, because then we can more quickly Help others to recognize their tendency. If you're walking with someone, help them recognize, are you trying to deny this? Are you trying to run away from it? Or are you wanting to win? What, help them recognize their typical. And remember, God wants us to make that effort to live in peace. So the word overlook, we'll start with overlook because in Proverbs 19.11, it says it, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Overlooking is one of the first choices that we can make. And, you know, I believe a huge percentage of our conflicts could be resolved if we would make this simple choice. Can I overlook this? You know what? They said something. I don't know. They meant it. It was not. I am not going to take this personally. I'm going to choose to overlook. This is not under the rug. This is not denying. This is a choice that we make to say, 
this is not worth destroying relationship or having a conflict. This is not worth destroying my peace with me, with this other person, and with God. Choose to overlook. It is to our own glory to choose that. That's God's word to us. It's to hit our glory and his glory to overlook a transgression. Sometimes we can't. And of course, that. so first question I'm asking is, can I overlook this? But if it's dishonoring to God, or if it's damaged your relationship, or if it's hurting other people, or if it's hurting the offender, then I need to be continually looking at those next steps. Then I shouldn't overlook. Then I'm allowing things to happen that God has given me insight into. We see it. And so I shouldn't overlook. Now I want to take a responsibility of working towards peace and maintaining peace. So can I say no? So we're just going to look. We're going to look at our conflict. And probably it's not one that you overlooked because you wouldn't have listed it here. <laughs> But maybe look at it in terms of those questions. And why did you choose to not overlook it? Or looking back, could you have chosen to overlook it? May I ask a question, Marsha? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by it? Is it to overlook in terms of thinking through the whole thing with what happened? Or is it in terms of giving grace and not? Yes, definitely it's giving grace. It's just, it's saying, I'm choosing to not make this an issue. I'm choosing to overlook it, to give grace to that person. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for the question. Yeah, thank you. So did you overlook or could you have? I appreciated Franke's question about um, what that meant and, um, and looking at the word grace, because it really is, it's a choice to give grace in a situation. Uh, it's a choice to say, I'm not going to hold this against you, or I'm not even going to take it up anymore in my thoughts. You know, I'm choosing to overlook. And um, what's interesting in it is those questions help us to see that it isn't giving grace to overlook if it is hurting that person or if it is hurting some others or if it's damaging God's character or our relationship. That's not giving grace. I think that's you know where sometimes we have to be careful. What is grace? Is it grace to allow someone to continue to hurt someone else? Not really. You know, so we have to recognize where is God's grace in this situation? It's an important um, perspective. Thank you, Frauke, for, for bringing up the concept of grace in that. Marsha, can I bring up another question that came up in the chat? Okay. And the question is, how can you tell the difference between denying and overlooking? Can they be blurred? Yeah, that's, I think that's a very good question. And it comes to the same, same idea, I think, in terms of, is it grace? Am I giving grace or am I simply um, denying the existence of this situation? Am I giving grace to this person or am I choosing to say, I'm, I'm not going to deal with this. Denying is I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to pretend I'm going to not deal with it. Overlooking is a ch choice I make to say, this is not going to be an issue. I will not entertain this in my mind and my thinking i'm going to offer grace and the next step which we would i would talk about here is and there's a forgiveness in that you know that was a casual comment it maybe wasn't even meant i forgive i, I choose that and i move on it's a very distinct choice versus just okay not going to deal with okay does that help i hope so Another part of those biblical responses are those go responses, where I go, um, maybe there's an accommodation in it, I want to, I'm going to give into this difference, because I want to preserve the relationship. That's much more important to me than being 
right or winning. Um, and sometimes there's a good place for accommodation. I can choose that. That's a choice. There's a reconciliation response of I want to work together so we can both win. So we can both win. And we're going to look a little bit more at these as we go forward, but these are goal responses. So we have overlooked response is biblical. The going and meeting with our with our opponent or those we have conflict with. And, um, and then the need to get help. So we want to recognize those good responses that God shares with us. We recognize from Matthew 18, one of the things we often look at when we look at peacemaking and we look at conflict. If your brother sins, and some versions say, if your brother offends you, go and reprove him in private. And if he listens, you've won your brother. If he doesn't listen, take another with you, witnesses to confirm the facts. If he still doesn't listen, we go to the church. If he still doesn't listen, we consider him as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. Now we've all probably heard teachings on that. And um, in this week, in this seminar, we will look at it a little bit more closely to say, what is this saying to us? Because the whole chapter, Matthew 18, is truly about peacemaking and reconciliation. And um, we'll take a look at that further as we go. But here's one of the things we often look at. And we look at the biblical responses of, of overlooking, but then going and later getting help. And those are responses that God shares with us in his word that we'll look at further. Under go, we have Matthew 5, 23 and 24. In Matthew 5, he says, if you're presenting your sacrifices at the altar and you suddenly remember something, someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice and go and be reconciled. God would rather have us be reconciled than be raising our hands and singing worship because worship, peacemaking is a form of worship to him and it is so strongly his heart. We just read Matthew 18 where it says that we should go privately and point out that offense. And in Ephesians 4.25, where it tells us, tell your neighbors the truth, because we're all part of the same body. So we go to our neighbors. We speak the truth in love. And we see that in many examples in the scripture as well. And then Matthew 18 goes on to tell us we can get help. Get help. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next couple of days, is more how can we be some of that help for others. In Proverbs 12, 15, it says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. There's a place to be the others in getting help. And in Matthew 18, 16, where we take one or two others with us, that the testimonies would be confirmed, that truth will be spoken. And in 1 Corinthians 6, four to five it even tells us if you have legal disputes why go outside to judges that aren't respected by the church what i am saying is this should shame you isn't there anyone in the church who is wise enough to decide these issues paul speaks to us to say why do we take our conflict to the world why are we not learning to deal with our conflict among us? Can we be those that are helpful in that respect? Hopefully, as member care workers, we can at least take some of those first steps in being a help. What was your response in your situation? Did you have a response and then you changed to another one? What is your tendency? Escape, attack? or peacemaking. Maybe you had a combination, but take a look at that past conflict and see what kind of response did you have? So did you all get to a peacemaking response in your conflict? I, I hope so. I <laughs> uh, hope that we always get to that place. One of the things that we recognize is the glorify, we glorify God by moving towards conflict, not by running away from it, but by moving towards it, because that's when we have a chance 
to see the opportunities of glorifying God, of helping others and learning about ourselves. And so in the peacemakers, they have what they call the four G's of resolving conflict. And the first one is how can I glorify God in this situation? It seems funny to think I can glorify God in the midst of conflict, but if we learn, if we learn about ourselves and if we help others learn about themselves, there is a real possibility for us to glorify God. We can also glorify God by the fact that people see that we can work through conflict. We look, as we said, at the world and all the wars, rumors of wars and conflict among us. We recognize the world is not doing so well at figuring this out. So if we can, if we can work towards peace and learn how to be reconciled with one another, God can and will be glorified. How can I glorify God in this? And we recognize one of the ways we glorify God is to give. I choose to overlook. And if I've chosen to overlook, that means I've also chosen to forgive. I'm not going to hold this against that person. I've chosen to take it out of my thoughts and let it go. And I just want to encourage us when we think about true forgiveness. And you all know we could teach the whole week on forgiveness, <laughs> you know, because it is such a key in our lives. And, and it's we many of us have heard plenty of sermons on it. But we recognize that forgiveness is a key in all areas of peacemaking. But we want it to be a true forgiveness, not a forgiveness that says, yep, I forgive you. But something that has our heart in a way that is not going to come back again. And so in your, on your worksheet, there's a little box that shares some of the things about forgiveness. You know, if we can stamp forgiven on that other person. It says, and I'm saying, if I forgive, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is not something that I'm going to keep my thoughts on. I'm not going to bring it up again against you. I'm not going to bring it up against you. This is an interesting one. Ken Sandy talks about the fact that he was meeting with a couple in marriage counseling. And the husband said, my wife is so historical. And Ken said, do you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. Whenever we get in conflict, she brings up everything I've done in the past. All of the history. And so often that's the kind of thing that can happen as a conflict grows is that we keep bringing up the history and we bring up the past. If we've truly forgiven, we're not going to bring that incident up again. If we can keep those short accounts on any incidents, we're going to have much better relationships. So if we've truly forgiven, we won't bring it up again. If we've truly forgiven, we're not going to talk to others about it. We're not going to talk to others about it. God spoke to me on this once when I was teaching because I had had a conflict with someone and I used it as an example. Now, I didn't use their name, but I used it as an example. And I, I just thought, I want to make sure that, that this isn't the wrong thing of forgiveness. Have I really put this in the past enough that um, you know I'm not going to talk to others about it? It made me really look at the situation and be sure that I was in a good place with regards to forgiveness. And if I forgive it, I'm not going to let this stand between us or hinder our relationship. So you can see that the overlooking and the grace given and overlooking is a part of this forgiveness as well. Again, a choice to forgive. Think of how many conflicts could be solved right here, right here in forgiveness and choosing to put this aside. Have you forgiven? As you look at your conflict that you just have been writing about, can you affirm the four statements regarding true forgiveness? And are any of them challenging to you as you read them? Forgiveness is a huge key to us in resolving conflict and something that we want to encourage those that we're working with to consider as well. If we look at Matthew 18, again, a, a chapter that speaks so much about peacemaking and reconciliation, we see the story there of the unforgiving servant where the master forgave his servant great amount of money. And then that servant did not forgive the one who was serving him or who owed him a small debt. We recognize how God so 
challenges us and, and, and tells us we need to be those who forgive, even as he's forgiven us. Considering our huge debt, we need to be those who forgive. So we recognize that as the real key in the area of conflict. The second thing um, in looking at peacemaking is the whole realm of getting the log out of our own eye. What, what's in our own heart? What is it that's happening in our own heart? And that is, of course, a, an especially important thing for us to look at. In Matthew 7, we know the verses, don't we? Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, here, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Jesus himself says, hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Jesus himself was very clear in telling us, be careful here, folks. Don't go trying to pick it out of your, bro your brother when there's that thing in yourself that's getting in the way. What are those logs? The second G in the peacemaker is to get the log out of your own eye. Get the log out of your own eye. This is the place where we have that time to look at our own hearts and to recognize what's going on in my life. What is the log in my life? What has brought me to this place of conflict? Is, do I have a role in this conflict? Why was I so easily offended? Or why did this impact me the way it did? What's going on in my own heart? So get the log out of your own eye or check your own heart. You all know um, the, most of us know the King's kids, you know, oh, it's time for a heart check. You know, when their leaders recognize, oh, there's some conflicts going on here, time for a heart check. And everyone stops and checks their hearts in terms of relationships. I think that is such a powerful thing they do. And I've seen it happening. I've seen people, you know, weeping and going to one another because they checked their hearts and found that there was a log in it, or there was something that they were holding against someone else. So God calls us to take a look at the log in our own eyes. Those logs might be sin. They might be idolatry or desires that have become too important. The log might be our own history of things that we haven't dealt with. Maybe there is some unforgiveness, or there's a bitterness growing up in us. What's behind my frustration with this decision a leader made? Does it have to do with my history with leaders? Have I dealt well with my history? So there are many logs <clears throat> that really get in the way of us seeing clearly when we are in the midst of a conflict and God would have us check our hearts. The Holy Spirit would wanna come and say, what's going on in your life that is helping with this, making this conflict be so important? Get the log out of your own eye. And that goes back to what we read in James. Is it about your pleasures? Is it about spending it on your heart's desires? Is there a log in your eye? This was a section of the book. When I first read the Peacemaker book, I was so taken by the section on getting the log out. And not just, hopefully not just because my life was so full of sin or anything, but because it helped me understand how idols can grow, how desires can become more important than they should be, how, how I can let something grow from just being something I want um, to being something much bigger. And if you go back to your, your handout where it speaks to you about the choices we make with our desires, you will see that we can go a peaceful way or we can go a way that makes for conflict. The response of faith. So I have a desire, there's something I'd like, and I can choose a faith response and realize that I might not get it. I can accept that God's plan is better than my desire and I can trust God. Or I can go that way of idolatry. I desired something and I need to have it. I really need to have it. I need to have what I want done, done. Or I need this person to do this for me. I have to have it. And I can move into a place where now if you don't agree or help me, you're wrong. And I begin to judge you as being wrong. 
and then the punishment. If you don't agree or you don't help me, then I punish you. That might be a silent treatment. That might be leaving a relationship. All kinds of ways that we punish one another. If something has become too important in our life, an idol. We don't need to have statues to have idols. <laughs> we can have desires that have become idols in our lives. Yeah. And this is where so much conflict comes. Those desires become so, so large. This is just a little, a little input there that a, a way to check our hearts. You know, what kind of desires have become too important for us? What's the first thing I think of in the morning and the last thing at night? I had to deal with that one because I recognized my computer, my iPad was next to my bed all the time, you know? And so I was taking a look before I went to sleep and picking it up in the morning. And I had to say, this is not what I want to be first and last. Uh, I want God to be first and last. How would we complete the sentence? If only this, then I'd be happy or then I'd be fulfilled. This one always, this one always struck me. Uh, as a single woman and meeting with a number of single women friends and they were sure that if only they were married they'd be happy and it might be true <laughs> that it would be good to be married and be happy but when it became something that was so important that this is what you know they were looking at you know they were looking at um, the the pictures of the new students coming in to see if any of them looked you know like oh that one's interesting it became something that was so on their hearts that it began to impact other parts of their lives. What am I afraid of? And this one, what's so important to me that I'm willing to lose a relationship for it? And that one comes right into our whole realm of conflict, doesn't it? What is so important to me that I'm willing to lose this relationship? That probably is a pretty good size idol, unless unless or it has to do something with really truth and avoidance of sin. Beware of these questions, heart questions. Can you recognize in your conflict the desires on each side? Can you recognize your desire? Can you recognize maybe what the other person's desire was? And how did you deal with that? Is there something to learn about your own desires? I think this is a deep question. It would take a few, a few minutes to take a look at that. Huh? So this is one of the places where conflict becomes an opportunity because it becomes an opportunity for me to grow, for me to learn about myself and to become more like Jesus because I've put my heart open before him. And sometimes we don't recognize these things until a conflict comes our way and we go, uh-oh. Look at where my heart is. And so let's see our conflict as an opportunity to grow. Constantly being learners. And this is the verse we mentioned earlier. We recognize something is in my heart. And I need to leave my sacrifice and go to my brother to be reconciled. Then I can come back and offer my sacrifice to God. So we want to be those who are reconciled and recognizing our part in it. If I'm truly repentant, I want to go to my brother and I want to repent. I'm going to ask forgiveness for what I've recognized in my own heart. And I'm just going to give you these somewhat briefly. The um, six, six, uh, seven, is it seven? Yeah. The, the A's of, of repentance just as a reminder to us, if we do go and ask forgiveness, we want to be sure to ask forgiveness of everyone that's been involved. So if we have a conflict and it happened between two of us, we're addressing that person. If the conflict happened in front of our class, where I did something I knew I needed to repent of in front of a class, then I need to somehow address that situation to that whole group of people who were involved. I remember a DTS where that happened for me and, um, you know, I needed to repent in front of the whole class. And, and what was interesting to me, and I will always remember it, is that was a hard thing to do. But I had a student later come and just, just crying, actually, and saying, I've never had a leader do that. And 
um, and it had a big impact on her because I had asked forgiveness and repented. And, you know, I, that's not, of course, what was behind it for me. It was just, I knew I needed to do it. But we recognize the power of just being vulnerable and being those who are repentant when we recognize sin in our lives. That's a huge part of being a peacemaking person as a, as a member care worker, but just as one of God's children. Address everyone involved. And I'm going to make one other note here because um, sometimes we want to go and address someone. We want to ask forgiveness for, for the fact that I was so mad at you. <laughs> you know, and, and that person might not even have known it, but we get to go to them and say, I'm just, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I was so mad at you when you said that. <laughs> well, we got our chance to tell them we were mad about what they said. We didn't need to address them. They didn't know our thoughts. God did. That's where I address God and I get forgiven. Not when I go and tell someone who didn't even know what my thoughts were. Avoid using the words if, but, or maybe. I'm sorry if I did that or but. Be specific in our admission and asking forgiveness. I think that so goes with the fact that if it's, if I've been convicted of something, God has been specific with me. So when I repent of it, I should also be specific with how God was specific to me. We need to acknowledge the hurt if what we've done has hurt them. We need to be willing to accept the consequences, express our desire to alter our behavior, and be sure that we've asked forgiveness. It's not, a, it's not like a list you want to go through, but it's just a good thing to remind us when we repent, these things are significant. And if we really want to ask forgiveness in a way that honors that person and honors our choice actually with God. Did you need to repent in your situation? And in that repentance, was it real? Was it honoring the other person? Did it turn out well? How might you do it differently? Those, uh, those A's of, of repentance are actually a good thing for you to coach others in, find yourself in a place of coaching others in. So kind of a good thing to, to be ready to share with others as well. Maybe some of us, even at this point in time, recognize a place that would be good to repent in. So hopefully, as we've looked back, we're learning and growing personally and also learning how we might help others. We recognize that we go to ask forgiveness. And so important, let me just say one thing here, because when you go for forgiveness and at, to ask forgiveness, don't go expecting them to respond with asking forgiveness too. Sometimes we're sometimes we're going and we're thinking, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna repent for what I did, but I'm gonna expect them to repent. They might not be at that place. Recognize that we're not going with that motivation. We're going to make sure our hearts are right with God, and we are doing all we can to pursue peace with others. Because there are times that we need to go to our brother as well. We recognize, yes, we've done some things. We have a part in the conflict. But we also recognize that we need to share something with our brother. We read that in Matthew 18, 15, where it tells us, if your brother offends you, go to your brother. Go. Go to your brother. Don't go to other people. Go to your brother. And we read in Galatians 6, it says, if your brother sins against you, go to your brother. Go to your brother obviously also your sister and james 5 19 and 20 it tells us there that if we see our brother wandering from the truth go to your brother because there's a reward for restoring them it's a place where conflict has that opportunity for us to glorify god by helping our brothers and sisters as well because we see what's happening and God longs for us to be part of a body that restores and brings back and reconciles people with each other, but also with God. So there are times for us to go 
to our brother. And God is clear in telling us to do that. So sometimes, you know, it's like Ken Sandy tells the story of sitting of the secretary who was sitting in the same pew at church with her boss, who she knew was having an affair. And there's the boss sitting with his wife and they sat there on the same pew for a whole year in church with the secretary knowing that. And he says, so what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Are we the body of Christ? Are we willing? Are we willing to do the go, to do the confront, to be the body in that way? And in that to glorify God. That's not, that's a big question sometimes. But God asks us to go and to gently restore, to gently restore, to speak the truth in love, to encourage others to be reconciled with God. And of course, the gentleness is a key here, isn't it? It's to, to be sure that we've prepared our own hearts, that we're not going as accusers. We're not going those to tear down and to win some conflict, but we're going as those who want to draw our brother or sister closer to the Lord because we see we've either been offended, we've sin been sinned against. We'll talk a little more about confrontation tomorrow, but God does call us at times to speak the truth in love to our brothers, to our sisters, to go and gently restore. That's one of the parts, one of the peacemaking uh, steps as well in God's word. Gently restore. To be sure that we're seeking God's heart, that we approach with humility and in it wanting to be redemptive. As we speak, as we confront, we want to only speak what we've observed, how it has affected us, and our response are you hoping? to see happen here. Confront when it's necessary. Confront when it's necessary. This is where conflict becomes an opportunity for them to grow. In your situation, did you need to confront that other person? And did you lovingly brother in it? Was it received well? Just kind of, we're finishing up here. And, um, the whole realm of confrontation, as I said, we'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow as well. And uh, we want to just finish looking at, I hope this is sufficient, Arnold. Um, I'll go back to it at the very end here. Um, we want to just take a few minutes and just remember that the, the, the fourth G is to go to our brother. You know, there just is a time that that is so important to be sure that we've gone and dealt with this with the other person because this is another place of opportunity it's an opportunity to love and to serve our brother by helping them look at their own hearts and their own situation together with god so there's an opportunity for us to grow an opportunity for our brother or sister to grow and an opportunity to glorify god that's what we long for in working through our conflict situations. And um, this will be the last question that is, it's on your chart and I will leave for you to do uh, after we finish here to check on, is that relationship reconciled? And do you need to do some work further? Again, tomorrow we'll look a little bit more on what do we do with those more challenging situations. We'll do that, especially on Thursday. But this is on your worksheet. And so you can take a look at it as we finish here. Just to remind you, the call on our lives is to be peacemakers and to be called the children of God. Blessed are you as you are that. I'd like to encourage you for tomorrow, okay, to prepare for tomorrow. You received a Bible study on Barnabas, who was a peacemaker. And we recognize some characteristics of a peacemaker that can help us become peacemakers in our situation and can help establish a community or a, a surrounding of peace. So I encourage you to, if you can, take the time to do that Bible study. We will go through it, but quite quickly tomorrow. So if you want to get a little deeper into it, I encourage you to do that tonight.
And then if you would also just look over the handouts for tomorrow, particularly the Peace Pursuit Quick Guide. Okay. Um, one of the things we long to do in our member care courses is to provide practical tools. And so that's a lot what I'm trying to do with this step by step, but also tomorrow we'll look at a couple other tools that can be very helpful in helping others resolve conflict. So be blessed as peacemakers. <laughs>